duck on the rock. After all, the duck is what got me here, and and you too, as far as I'm, it, that goes, because I assume you're here to learn more about this new game. And this duck on the rock got me to the Olympics this past summer over in Berlin, Germany. The 1936 Games. You probably saw some moving pictures of the games and maybe saw some in the newspapers. But it was nice to be invited over there, except of course it was Berlin, Germany. and. Hitler tried to use the games as a propaganda weapon to promote his ideology as the supremacy of the Aryans, the whites. But I'm sure you're proud of the American athletes, as was I. Matt Robinson took second place in the 100 meter dash. He's a Negro. They say his brother Jackie's a very promising baseball player, but I guess you'll never get to see him in the major leagues because he's a Negro. And of course, Jesse Owens, four gold medals. What a performance. They say Hitler was so embarrassed he left the stadium. Well, Duck on the Rock is a game we played up in Canada, where I was born, up in Benny's Corners near Almont, Ontario. I was of Scottish heritage. We had a lot of the values from the Scottish traditions passed down. One of them was self-sufficiency. I'll never forget my grandfather's words. Dinner, thank you, can I master it, son? Do it and make a man of yourself. Well, those ideas, that advice stayed with me and came in handy a number of times. I remember one time my friends were all playing hockey, but I had no skates and we couldn't afford any. But suddenly, aha, I got an idea. I went out to the blacksmith shop and I found a couple little files and I set them into some hickory, blocks of hickory, and the next day I laced that hickory to my boots, and I was out skating with my friends. Well, those were good years in Benny's Corners, but when I was about nine, my father decided we would leave. He was going to take a job in a sawmill about 100 kilometers away. So we left Benny's Corners, and things went pretty well for about a year, but then there was a typhoid epidemic, and my father got the typhoid. So my mother got worried about my brother and my sister and I catching it, the disease, so she decided we should go back to Benny's Corners. So I remember it was a winter day and my uncle came out in the sleigh and we loaded everything up and we waved goodbye to my mother there in the doorway. And that's the last we saw them. They both died of the typhoid a few weeks later. So we ended up living with my uncle back in Benny's Corners and I'd help him on the farm and. I wasn't very motivated for school, I wasn't a very good student, so when I was 15 I dropped out and I helped him on the farm and in the winters I'd go work as a lumberjack and I enjoyed that for several years, but as you can imagine it's a fairly tough crowd and quite a bit of drinking and I remember one night we were in a tavern having some drinks and and suddenly a fellow looked over at me and he said, say you're Margaret Young, Young Naismith's son, are you not? I said, aye, she was my mother. He said, you know, she turned over in her grave to see you drinking like that. Well, I put that grass down and I walked out of that tavern and I'd never been back. I decided I needed some new direction in my life and maybe I could do something to help my fellow man. Maybe I could be a minister. So I went back and finished my high school in a couple of years and in 1882 I headed up to Montreal to go to McGill University to study and study I did. I ended up fourth in my class of 87 that first year, but I also joined a couple teams. I joined the lacrosse team and the rugby team. So I kept working through those four years. There was another tragedy in the family. At one point I went home for a Christmas vacation to Benny's Corners and I was with my brother and he got a terrible stomach ache and it just got worse and worse and, and suddenly he died of a ruptured appendix. And it left me with a lot of questions. What's the purpose of my life? What motto could I live by? And it came to me a couple months later. I'd like to leave the world a little better than I found it. Well, gradually things became a little bit clearer for me. After I finished my four years at McGill, I decided to stay there in Montreal and go to the Presbyterian Seminary to become a minister. Well, I kept playing rugby, but this got me in big trouble. You see, the people in the church felt that Football is a tool of the devil. Anything pleasurable like that is sinful. And my rugby friends are saying, what are you doing going to church and praying all the time? You should be out playing with us, having fun. 
So I was kind of caught in the middle. I wanted both. And gradually a path opened up for me. First, there was a young man from Yale University, Amos Alonzo Stagg, came up to, to uh, Montreal and gave a talk about muscular Christianity, kind of new movement to promote a different view of Jesus, a stronger image of Jesus. And I liked that idea. And then I also went to talk to the YMCA. I'd been a member of the YMCA and really enjoyed working there, working out. And I went to talk to Mr. Budge, the director, and he told me there's a new school opened up in Springfield, Massachusetts called a School for Christian Workers. And they've taken on the job of training young men to work in YMCAs. So I finished my studies there at the seminary and ended up going to Springfield in 1890. The head of the physical program then was Luther Gulick. He was high energy. He was full of ideas. One of his ideas he brought to Springfield was this concept of spirit, mind, body, all integrated, all connected within each of us, as opposed to the dualism that the church had talked about. Another of his ideas was we needed a football team at Springfield College, he decided. And it happened that Lonnie Stagg, I mentioned a minute ago, had transferred from Yale to Springfield. He decided to go into physical education rather than the ministry. And he had played football at Yale. In fact, he'd been an All-American. So Luther Gulick asked Lonnie if he'd like to start the team there. And he said, sure. So 13 of us went out for the, for the football team. And we had a lot of fun playing. Another of Luther Gulick's ideas was we needed a new game for these long winter months. You see, this is the Industrial Revolution, and a lot of young men are leaving the farms to come to the cities, but in the North there's not much to do, and the YMCA's offered as best they could calisthenics and etc., but they were very boring after a few weeks. So he said, we've got to come up with a new game, and he offered a class called the Psychology of Play. And I took the class, and at one point in the, in the class he said, there's nothing new under the sun, only recombinations of elements that already exist. I raised my hand. I said, if that's the case, all we have to do is find a new combination and we'd have the game you're talking about. He said, you're right, James. That's your homework assignment. Well, none of us came up with a, a completion to that then. But a couple months later, I did come up with a game. In fact, we called it the new game for a while. And then one of my students came and said, Mr. Naismith, what are you going to call your new game? I said, I hadn't thought much about it. He said, why not Naismith Ball? I said, Naismith Ball, that name would kill any game. He thought for a moment, and then he said, why not Basketball? Two words, and that's the name that stayed. Well, I stayed at Springfield a couple more years and taught, and then I ended up going to Kansas University, and that's where I've been teaching for the last 38 years. I did some coaching, too. In fact, one time we coached against a team that had a player named Jesse James. You might have heard of him. I was probably the only losing coach they ever had at Kansas University, but, you know, I don't think that's what sports are about, winning. I think sports are to build character. I remember telling my students, we must learn to win graciously, lose courteously, accept criticism as well as praise, and always respect the attitude of the other player. Well, I left Springfield and so did the young men. Springfield College had become by then the International YMCA Training School. So young men were leaving Springfield and going all over the world. And that's why by 1936 there were 22 nations with basketball teams and they introduced basketball then. And among those 22 nations and teams were 17 coaches from Springfield College. Well, I skipped over quite a quite a few years there, and including, for example, how during the Great War I was over in France trying to support our troops. And I remember the little joy I got seeing a basketball hoop on a shed there in the, some village in France as I walked around. Well, I've left a lot out, as I said, and uh, there are a lot of things about the early evolution of the game I could share with you. and I could tell you how my wife saved football in America, how did Duck on the Rock help me com complete the homework assignment on December 20th and 21st of 1891? How did women get involved with a team sport for the first time in history? And maybe some other things that I thought about and worked on when I was out in Kansas. But 
perhaps we'd have to meet again and I could tell you some more of these stories. Thank you for your time.